Ahoy there, Captain Benzi here, coming at you with another video for Eve Echoes, again from inside the test server for the May balance patch update. Today, we're going to be taking a look at freighters. These are the first capital ships that are being added to Eve Echoes, and as such, they are absolutely massive. These are not just chonky boys, these are rated, oh lord, they coming. So today we're going to be looking at what capital ships are, how you build them, how you get hold of one, why you might want to build one of these particular freighters, and then we're going to examine the four current freighters in sort of explicit detail, looking and comparing them to each other. So, if you enjoy this video, let me know by hitting a like on it, sub to the channel for all things Eve Echoes, ding that notification bell to never miss an upload, as I do upload every day, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, with Eve Echoes content, and bonus videos on Saturday and Sunday. So don't miss out. Finally, if you do want to go the extra mile to help support this channel, you can do so either by pledging to support on Patreon, or indeed by checking out our Redbubble merchandise store for all kinds of cool and exciting gear. That's said and done though, let's talk about freighters and capital ships. First of all then, let's talk about how you actually make a capital freighter, because these are slightly different to other ships. Now, in order to actually get the blueprint, this is still done by reverse engineering. Now, obviously, every stat and thing that I'm showing here is based on my current main character, my frigate and destroyer main, so I have no skills whatsoever in any form of industrial manufacturing. So here we are looking at the Fenrir. Now obviously if I want to reverse engineer this, we use level 10 Minmatar ship debris, we need mechanical data cores and Minmatar data cores, which, you know, I mean, it's fairly straightforward, makes sense. 60 of each of those without training. And you can see here that me with no skills whatsoever, I have a success rate of 7%. So yeah, you really are going to want to train those skills. But let's actually have a look at the Fenrir blueprint itself, remembering again that this is completely without any form of manufacturing or industrial skill at all. So let's have a look. First of all, in order to make one of these, yes, you need to be tech level 10. Of course you do. The manufacturing time is an absolutely massive 17 days and 8 hours, with a manufacturing cost that makes my eyes bleed. The material efficiency and time efficiency, as you can see here, is based on me not having any form of uh, like actual industrial skill. But the bit I really want to draw your attention to are the salvaged part requirements here. Because this blueprint isn't just a case of, oh, you need so many minerals and so many PI and that kind of thing. It requires actual individual components, like if you're building a capsule outpost or a corporation citadel. So, for example, here on the Fenrir, you're going to need five capital armor plates, you're going to need 24 capital cargo bays, 15 capital construction parts, and nine capital propulsion engines. These are things that you then build yourself. Again, you buy the blueprints for these on the market, and you build these parts using things like your ores and your PI. That's how that works. So if you're really wanting to get involved in capital manufacturing, you can actually start stocking up on all these and more different capital parts. Buy the blueprints, start building all these cargo bays and engines and construction parts and armor plates, that kind of thing, and start stocking up. Because when they add the other capital ships, the dreadnoughts, etc., which they've said they're looking to do around about August time, you'll have a load of parts already that you can just then assemble into those different ships. It might be something worth considering. But again, this is all based entirely here on me having no skills whatsoever, and I quite like this as a system. I like the fact that you're building the individual parts and then putting those parts together into a gigantic capital ship. This does give me nightmares of what it's going to be like when we go to put titans together, because holy heck, just as a, an idea, when we talk about the first titan that was built in EVE Online, the developers at CCP actually had to double check that everything had been done legitimately because there was that much stuff involved. I think it took about three months of a combined alliance effort to build one Titan, and it took all of seven minutes of failed unlock uh, log off timer um, to destroy it at the end. And that wreckage is actually still in the game. You can go and find the wreckage of Steve. But anyway, I digress. I just I like this system. I like the fact that ultimately you're not just throwing ores at something. Um, I mean, ultimately you are, but you throw it in pieces, and it's just that little bit more involved, and it makes it a bit more special to build a capital ship. Anyway, as I said, this is me without skills, so let's jump in and actually have a look at the various different capital skills. So here we are in the skill tree. Let's start off, first of all, by continuing that theme of how to build a freighter. So we're going to look at the industrial skills that have been added relevant to this, because there are two sets that are now added. 
The first one that you'll find here under industrial technology and production is, of course, freighter manufacture. Training into this is going to reduce the amount of materials required to build your freighter and is going to require, uh, reduce the amount of time required to build it by increasing the efficiency of both of those. 30% increased efficiency for material, 20% increased time efficiency. Faster build um, plus fewer components. And of course this carries on into advanced freighter manufacture, but it's now 20% in both. The, uh, the freighter manufacturing material has gone from 30 down to 20. Um, but once we hit expert, the manufacturing material efficiency drops all the way to 5% addition, but an additional 20% on the time. Now a key point to remember here is, this is relative to the amount of uh, the actual components that you need. Things like the propulsion engines, the armor plates, the cargo bays, that kind of thing. And you may think, well okay, but I'm only going to be dropping that from say 9 down to um, 6 if I fully train into this. But yeah, that's a big, big drop. It may be fewer cargo bays, you know, only a, a few cargo bays are going from say 15 down to uh, 12. Those three cargo bays use a lot of minerals to actually build each. So by dropping three cargo bays, you're saving three cargo bays worth of minerals, which is a big, big drop. And speaking of which, if we go a little bit further down, you'll see we also have capital ship component manufacture. This again, it's 30% increase to material efficiency, 20% increase to time efficiency. At advanced, it's 20 and 20 on both. And at expert, it's five and 20. So there's a nice little steady theme going on there. This affects the amount of minerals, PI, etc. required to actually build those components. So the idea is that you twin both of those skills together. So 100% you want to take um, expert, uh, sorry, capital ship component manufacture and freighter manufacture sort of one level at a time each. I would actually train it 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, then into advanced 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 4, 4, then back into basic 5, 5, advanced 5, 5, expert 1, 2, uh, 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, three, four, four, five, five, and that's how you max it up, increasing your efficiency as effectively as possible. It's a double-edged sword, you're burning both sides of the candle here. On one hand, you're reducing the amount of components required, and on the other hand, you're reducing the amount of materials required to make those components. So it is vital that you are training into both of those if you're looking to build yourself some freighters, and indeed, capital ships in future, because remember, this capital ship component manufacture is going to help you later on as well when you build things like dreadnoughts and jump freighters, maybe even titans and some of the other massive ships that will be eventually added to Eve Echoes. Okay, so those are the industrial skills. What about on the other side of things? Well, as you'd expect, there is going to be cruising technology. If we scroll right the way down through this, we now have Freighter Command, which drops the inertia modifier by 25% and increases the velocity. Same with Freighter Advanced Freighter Command, only by 10% though on each of those. An Expert Freighter Command is then an additional 10% of each of those. So a lower inertia modifier means you can accelerate and decelerate faster, you turn in a line and reach warp faster, and the velocity means, well, exactly that, you are a faster moving ship. Obviously, if we go into defense upgrade as well, right at the bottom we now have freighter defense upgrade which adds 40,000 hit points to shield, armor, and structure in basic, and then at advanced upwards it becomes 25% additional and 12.5% additional. Now remember, with how big the, uh, the actual numbers are on a freighter, that 25% increase is huge, like it really does add a lot. And considering freighters are completely defenseless on their own, defense upgrade is actually a useful skill to train into, especially since the freighters themselves also get bonuses from training into this skill, as they do from freighter command. Each of the four freighters currently gets bonuses from freighter defense upgrade and from freighter command, the basic variant. So those are well worth training into as well if you intend to fly these. Now, of course, there is also engineering, freighter engineering, which is going to increase the manufacturing material cap uh, efficiency, which is pretty cool. A 30% reduction in the amount of warp capacitor required. And interestingly enough, freighter power grid gets increased by 25%, which just seems stupid because they don't have any module slots and they only have eight megawatts of power grid anyway, despite the fact that you cannot fit modules to these things. So I'm not entirely sure what's going on with those. Freighter engineering is one of those skills I genuinely actually wouldn't even bother with it. It doesn't really do much other than that warp capacitor needs. You just use less capacitor to achieve warp, but that's not a huge problem. Ultimately, 
you've got big capacitor banks, humongous ship, um, you should never be flying one of these things solo as we'll talk about later, so does it matter if you have to take a few seconds just to recharge your capacitor in a jump? I, I don't really think it does. This is a bit of a weird skill for me and I kind of expect this to be changed at some point because it really doesn't do anything. It's a really weird skill and part of me thinks they should just kind of take it out. I don't know. Give the freighters a slight um, in in increase to their capacitor if you really think it needs it um, for the jumping and that, but otherwise it doesn't really do much and it's unusual to see manufacturing material efficiency increased here. This is the only per reason to train this. It means if you're building freighters, you kind of want to train into freighter engineering, which is a really weird thing to say. If you're a, an industrial pilot, this may be the first of the engineering skills that you actually trade into, because otherwise there's really no need for them. But here, manufacturing material efficiency from engineering. That's the only reason you have to do this. If you're flying them, who cares about freighter engineering, weirdly. But if you're building them, then the freighter engineer skill is actually pretty useful. Yeah, it's weird, but anyway. In this next section, we're going to examine each of the four freighters individually and compare them to each other. We're going to talk about which ones are best and worst at various different aspects, because you might be surprised. When I was going through and actually having a look at these statistics, they surprised me, and things that I kind of assumed would be the case, like, oh, this one's going to be the fastest, this one's going to be the most agile, this one's going to have the biggest space, that kind of thing, actually surprised me. These do break the kind of the Four Empires themes just a little bit, and I'm not sure if that's intentional. If it is intentional, I do like it. It's unusual. It gets people thinking about which freighter they're going to use. So we're going to examine these one by one, talk about what they do um, and what they do differently to each other, and there will be literally this is the best at this, this is the worst at that. And we're going to start here with the Kaldari Charon. Yes, it is Charon, not Charon. Charon was the ferryman who took you across the River Styx to the afterlife. It's not the Charon, it's the Charon. 2,461 meters in length. Two and a half kilometers long, this ship. That's, uh, that, that, that's a big ship. Anyway, let's have a look at the attributes and fittings on this one. So first things first, I'm just going to say straight off the bat, the uh, power grid here of 8 megawatts and the capacitor of 8,349, which you can see at the bottom there, those are the same across the board for all four freighters, as are the fitting profiles. None of the freighters have high, mid, or low slots. They all have three combat rigs and three engineering rigs. These have no defensive capabilities whatsoever. If you leave high sec with one of these, you are opening yourself up to being, like, scrambled by literally anything, anyone, and torn apart. I'm already seeing kill mails of things like this being taken out by a swarm of 10 or 15 Condor 2s, for crying out loud. These are big, heavy ships, they're very slow, they've got massive amounts of armor and defenses, sure, but they cannot stop anyone from destroying them. You do need to have a fleet in support if you're going into low sec and null sec, you have been warned. Anyway, the Charon. The cargo hold of the Charon is an insane 325,000 cubic meters. That is an incredibly large cargo hold, and it is actually the largest of the four main freighters currently being added to the game. 325,000, like literally that is considerably larger than the next one down. It is 30,000 cubic meters larger than the second position, which is the Fenrir. Defensively though, 3,000, sorry, 348,671 defense is the lowest of the four freighters. Being Kaldari, this is mainly in the shields and it does have the largest shield of the lot at 125,514. The armor of 84,730 and the structure of 86,013, however, are the lowest of all the four freighters. So it's got the biggest shield, but the lowest armor and structure, which does bring its average down, making the total defense the lowest of the lot. So you've got the biggest cargo hold, but the lowest defenses overall. As we move on, we hit the signature radius and flight velocity. The flight velocity is a terrifyingly slow 54 meters per second. Like, I know that's faster than I could ever dream of running, but it doesn't feel like it when you undock one of these things and actually start to move it. It is insanely slow. Insanely slow. Uh, this is actually the slowest of the four freighters, which makes sense. Kaldari tends to be the slower ships. 
and the signature radius again being Caldari, it is the largest at 7,257.8 meters. This is the kind of ship that, to coin Sovereign RPG's phrase, you could hit from Jita, undock at Jita, and you can shoot this thing if it's in Nullsec. It's that big of a target. So does it really matter who the biggest or smallest signature radius is? Well, no. In general, no, no it doesn't, but I found it interesting. The Caldari is the largest of the signature radiuses, which you'd kind of expect. Now, as we come down, though, the mass here is insane. 960 million kilograms. That is such a heavy ship. The inertia modifier looks really low at 0.0375, and all four of the freighters have that exact same inertia modifier. So if we multiply this together, you actually end up with an agility rating of 36 million, which is huge. This takes days to align to something, it takes days to reach its maximum speed, and to warp away. Like, freighters are not fast. These are the slowest ships, the slowest, most cumbersome ships currently available in EVE Echoes, and yeah, they, they really, really are going to take a long time to get anywhere. But the amount of stuff they can carry more than makes up for that. If you need to get from A to B, yeah, it's going to take you longer than most ships could, you know, a lot of ships can get there and back two, three times in that time, but you're carrying literally 15 times more than other people would. So, yeah, it balances out there. 36 million agility rating, that is the highest of the four freighters, which does mean, again, this is the most cumbersome of the lot. But if we move into the trait description, this is where things get interesting on this. The Charon, as you'd expect being a Kaldari ship, does get an additional to shield resistance, 4% per level of freighter defense upgrade, told you freighter defense upgrade was going to be in, uh, important, giving you 20% better shield resistance. All four of the freighters get the same bonus from freighter command, again I told you that was going to be uh, useful, a 5% increase to cargo hold capacity, and 5% increase to flight velocity for a total of 25% faster, and 25% big bigger cargo hold, so you're getting an additional 25% uh, on top of that 325,000 cubic meters. In short then, the Charon is the biggest, it is the slowest, and other than its shields, it has the least overall defense. Just something to bear into consideration, but it does get very high resistance on those shields. So if you've got like a Repa nearby, a Scythe or something that's going to keep those shields up, the Charon will stay alive for a very long time. Next up then, let's have a look at the Minmatar Fenrir, the blockiest and, well, most like K9 from uh, Doctor Who looking of the freighters of all of them. It's an unusual looking ship, to say the least. It's very blocky, very sort of oblongoid. It's not quite as long as the Charon either. It's about 500 meters shorter in length. Not that, again, that matters in any way, shape or form. It's still a humongous ship at 1,926 meters in length. Anyway, let's have a look at its stats and see how they compare. So first of all, our cargo hold capacity. This is, of course, one of the most important things to consider when flying a freighter. It's 295,000 cubic meters, which is, as I said, 30,000 less than the Charon has native at 325,000 cubic meters. So it does lose a fair amount of cargo storage as you go from the Charon to the Fenrir. This is the second largest um, cargo hold capacity of the four freighters. Defensively speaking, it is the second most tanky as well, 363,078 hit points. These are fairly well spread. You've got a fairly high shield, a good middling armor, and slightly toward the lower end on structure, but ultimately it's not the highest or lowest in any of those defenses. Again, capacitors and power grid we can completely ignore, and we come down to the signature radius. 5,697.7 meters is the smallest signature radius of any of these freighters, and the flight velocity is 65 meters per second is the fastest of the four freighters. That's kind of how you'd expect things for Minmatar. Small signature radius, high flight velocity, but it's a freighter, who really cares? 65 meters per second is not something worth celebrating, and being the smallest freighter, again, doesn't really do much. Like, it, it, they, they're not, if, if, if they were firing at you, they're not suddenly missing because you're smaller than the Charon. You are still 5,697.7 meters of signature radius. Nothing is missing that. Like, literally, that is it's a humongous signature radius. 
Now, the mass here is 940 million kilograms. The inertia modifier is the same as the others. That gives us an agility rating when we multiply them together of 35.25 million, which again is slightly more agile than the Charon, but interestingly enough, this is not the most agile of the freighters. In fact, it is the second least agile. It is only just behind the Charon. 36 million on the Charon, 35.25 on the Fenrir, which, yeah, there's not that much into it. And the trait descriptions get a bit unusual as well. We've got that same cargo hold capacity and flight velocity from Freighter Command, but Freighter Defense suddenly gives us a 4% increase to armor resistance. Now again, I'm not sure if this is intentional, I'm not sure if this is they've mixed up a couple of these, but if they haven't, I actually quite like this. I actually quite like that the armor resistance is increased here, because in EVE Online, Minmatar ships are not shield specialists. They use shields, they use armor, they are mainly about the speed. So, the fact that this is referencing quite nicely, the fact that there are several Minmatar ships that actually you would tend to armor tank, is pretty cool. I like that about the Fenrir, and I know I'm probably going to be shot down as weird in the comment section below, but I really like that about the Fenrir. I miss having Dromiels and things like that running armor repairers. It just, it, it's not a thing in Eve Echoes. Looking at a Rifter and using an armor repairer on it in order to save up those mid slots for additional tackle and things like that, it makes sense. So it's a nice little reference here. Um, it doesn't push the armor higher than any of the others. It's still not as high as some of the others on its armor, but it does really help out across the board. It means you have, you've still got those fairly large shields, but once they blow through your shields, you've still got a lot of armor to get through, which makes you an incredibly tanky freighter. Next up then is the Galente Obelisk, whereas the Charon is named after the ferryman who ferries you to the afterlife, and Fenrir is named after the wolf in Norse mythology that isn't going to swallow the sun during Ragnarok, the Obelisk is named after a small, a, a tall, pointy stone and it looks kind of like a brick as well. I quite like the look of the obelisk, actually. It looks exactly how you'd imagine a Galente freighter to look. Big cargo pods on the side there, massive engines the size of your entire city, um, and humongous sort of bridge on the top there. It's also the smallest in all directions, 1,162 meters um, in its longest axis. This is basically a floating cube, and there are certain Borg references I wanted to make there, but I'm not going to. As we look at the stats then, here we have a cargo hold of 290,000 meters cubed. Again, this is now the smallest of the freighters alongside the Providence. Spoiler alert, the Obelisk and Providence both share the smallest cargo hold at 290,000 cubic meters. Not that it's a small cargo hold, just not as big as the Fenrir's 295,000 or the Charon's 325,000. The defense on this thing is also monstrous. It's bigger than the Fenrir had at 360,833. Most of it is in armor and structure, and indeed the structure is the largest structure tank of the four freighters. No freighter um, has a higher structure value than the Obelisk. As we come a little bit further down though, we have a signature radius of 6,986.5, flight velocity of 58, which puts the obelisk firmly in the middle of all of the others. It's not as fast or slow as any of the others. It's right smack bang in the middle in regards to its flight velocity and its signature radius. The mass is nice and low here as well, you'll notice. We've gone from 960 million on the Charon, 940 million on the Fenrir, down to 900 million here on the Obelisk, which multiplied by that inertia modifier gives us a total agility rating of 33.75 million. Down from the Charon's 36 million, that's quite a drop, which gives us just that little bit more maneuverability, which you wouldn't necessarily expect for a Galente ship. They tend to be some of the more cumbersome ones out there. But there we go, as I said, things do get messed up with these freighters. As you'll notice here by the fact that Freighter Command still gives us the 5% cargo hold and 5% flight velocity, but Freighter Defense upgrade now increases our shield by 5%. Like, that's not exactly what I would have expected for a Galente ship. They're not exactly known for their shields. So there is a part of me that thinks maybe the Fenrir was supposed to have the 5% shield and the Obelisk was supposed to have the 4% armor resist, but I'm okay with it being this way around, because that takes the shield tank, actually, at full training, the additional 25%, takes the shield tank from 86,211 
up to 107,776, which suddenly pushes the obelisk right up there on paper as having the largest amount of EHP of the four freighters. The Providence does still just win out on its defences, um, but not on raw numbers. It only has that thanks to its resistances, which we'll see in a moment. But it's weird to see shield on a Galente ship. Not that you can fit shield modules, it just means the shield tank gets bigger as you train into freighter defense upgrade, which, again, I'm okay with it. It makes this interesting. So the obelisk, ultimately, you're looking at the, one of the smallest cargo holds, but one of the most tanky, whilst also still being fairly maneuverable, which is, you know, quite easy to see. But anyway, let's move on to our fourth and final freighter. Which is, of course, the Amar Providence. At 2,484 meters in length, it is the longest of the four freighters, and in typical Amar style, it has to be the most fancy and ostentatious looking as well. No, we can't just transport our goods from A to B, we've got to look good whilst doing it. Let's have a look at its stats then, and see if they hold up to how this thing looks. Well, first and foremost, as we said during the obelisk, the Providence does have the joint smallest cargo hold at 290,000 cubic meters. Still not small, it's just... It, 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 you're still looking at 35,000 cubic meters smaller than the Charon before we start including skills. So that's something worth bearing in mind if you do end up deciding that the Providence could be the ship for you. You are still 35,000 cubic meters shy of the Charon before training into skills. It's up to you to decide whether or not that actually matters, if you can still carry all the stuff that you want to, um, then who cares. As we look at the defences though, the 374,413 is the highest paper defence of the four. This is by far the biggest armour on paper of the four, uh, of the four uh, freighters, and yes, I do mean armour. Highest defence and highest armour. 118,701 is much bigger than any of the others. Obviously, the Galente one comes in at second with 103,986, but you can see you have 15,000 more hit points on armour, and that's just starting. It gets better later on. As we go further down, again, we've got a very large signature radius, 6,579 uh, 6, meters, fairly slow flight velocity of 59. It is actually the second fastest, though, of the <laughs> of the four freighters, coming in behind the Charon 65, but above the Obelisk's 58, way above the Charon's 54. So again, we're fairly middling here on its signature radius and its flight velocity. What surprised me here is the mass to inertia modifier. 820 million kilograms of mass to that 0.0375 times inertia modifier gives us a total agility rating of 30 million, 30.75 million agility, which is the lowest of the four. This is the most agile of the four freighters, a title I would have thought would have gone to the Fenrir. And Minmatar ships are known for their agility and speed, whereas here, the Providence actually wins on agility. Yeah, the Fenrir still has that 65 meters per second um, total flight velocity, whereas the Providence only has 59, but that agility actually means this thing does align and warp faster than the Fenrir does, so it is going to get you from A to B that little bit faster than perhaps the others would. And if we look at the trait description, again, we still have that freighter command bonus giving us 5% cargo hold capacity, 5% flight velocity, but we also get the uh, freighter defense upgrade giving us 5% additional armor. So this thing at full training has 25% bigger armor tank than we saw before. It was already the biggest armor tank at 118,701. That training takes up to 148,376, which means this by far has the highest base hit hit points of all of the freighters. This is the most defensive freighter, the most agile freighter, but it does have the smallest cargo hold. So it's kind of up to you which way you want to go here. As curious as it sounds, I really like this ship. The final roundup question that everyone's going to be asking about these four freighters then is ultimately which is going to be best. And really, there's not all that much in it when it comes down to it. It depends really what you intend to do, and I think in fairness, if you like the look of one of them more than the others, that's pretty much all it takes. The differences on paper look massive, but in actual practice, don't really do much. 
Like as I said, the Providence is theoretically the most defensively capable, it's got the highest HP across the board by quite a stretch, and it's also the most agile, which means it does actually move through space faster than any of the others. This is the fastest, and it's the most heavily armoured, but it also is joint worst for the amount of cargo that it can carry. But again, 290 thousand cubic meters to start with is not a small cargo hold and you may actually genuinely struggle to fill that up and if you never fill it up then who cares that the Charon has the biggest cargo hold the Providence is going to move faster on the other side of things if the cargo hold does matter to you then the Charon having 325,000 cubic meters to start with obviously is going to be pretty attractive yeah, it's the slowest of the lot, it's the biggest of the lot, it's got the worst agility of the lot, it also has the worst overall defences, the Charon, but it carries the most, so if you're going to be using all of that cargo space, then the Charon is probably the one for you. But again, even then, it's in the middle, like the Fenrir and the Obelisk, does that mean those are painted into obscurity and thus complete irrelevance? No. Not at all. They each have their own advantages. If, for example, you're going like through multiple stations in the same system, then the Fenrir is going to be an excellent option for you there. If you're going to be drifting in Nullsec as like a target, the Obelisk is actually a pretty good one because it's got that middle agility. It's really so little difference between the four that a lot of it's going to come down to personal choice. You can min-max the hell out of this if you really want to, but hey, you guys know how I feel about that kind of stuff in EVE Echoes. I think this is a game that's about enjoying things a bit more, so if you think you're going to enjoy one of these more than the other, go for that one. That's the one you should go for. If you think that the Fenrir looks cooler than any of the others, go for the Fenrir. If you need to have the biggest cargo hold, go for the Charon. If you want the one that I personally think is statistically the best, go for the Providence, as long as you can accept that it doesn't have a large cargo hold. But if you want something that looks really cool and sort of like you know, pretend to be a Borg trying to assimilate people, then 100% the Obelisk is going to be your best option. So, this wraps up today's video, and as I mentioned in the intro, we have a giveaway. It's We've been a couple of days now into the test server, so I want to hear what you've had most fun with. I know this test server is a bit of a mixed bag for a lot of us, myself especially. I was very disheartened at the start of this, I'll be completely frank. Um, but I still have hope that things can be changed. I know a lot of people have been having fun on the test server, and not even everyone at tech level 10. I've heard some great stories of people still stuck at tech level 8 or tech level 9, having a great time moving around with just ships that they couldn't have tried otherwise. So tell me, what fun things you've been doing on this test server. I will pick two of you randomly next week. I will announce those as the winners of this week's two months of Combo Omega giveaway. So two month of Combo Omega. One month of Combo Omega for two people. It's always confusing for me how to actually say that. Um, so yeah, let me know what you've been enjoying, in mo uh, enjoying most about this test. Good luck. Well done to the winners when we get around to that. Otherwise, folks, thank you for watching this one right the way to the end. Happy sailing, and see you in you Eden.